Hey, I'm glad to be here. I, I, you know, I'll start before I get into the show. Frank, we talk a lot. I, I, I touch on a little bit of consumer stuff or, or personal fraud in this conversation, but it all has the same theme, but uh, mostly focused on, on business because you're all business owners and business managers. Uh, but what, what Frank said is it, it happens all the time. My stepmother almost fell for it. She was starting to pull money together, thinking one of her grandkids. But Frank got one that it, it takes a lot of different forms. And this time of year, it actually spikes. We had two clients about two years ago that had this happen to family members, and it spiked in a unique way. Uh, and because what, 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 is this, what is this week represented here? Besides the state fair being over, what happens this week? Back to school. Back to school. What do most parents do, and I'd argue really stupidly, but what do they do when it's back to school time? Party. Party. <laughs> they post stuff on Facebook. And what do they post? They post pictures of little Michaela and Bobby standing in front of the door saying, welcome back to school, Michaela and Bobby. Now, I'm guessing our superintendent would tell you there's a lot of other safety reasons you not, don't do that. But there's a fraud reason. All it takes, and we've had this happen, somebody lures on Facebook, gets the name of the kids, easy to figure out the last name by who posted, because mom and dad typically have the same last name. They can get a little bit about family, because who's the brothers, who's the sisters. And all they have to do is follow to see who's following them, and they'll, 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 they'll follow the thread until they find what looks to be a grandparent, and then they make that phone call. Oh, Michaela can't help me, Dad, Grandpa or Grandma. Uh, I don't want to call her. You know, they, 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 they pick the juniors and seniors in high school because parents still post those pictures. We almost put the you know, back to school for 17th grade for my doctorate student, but we didn't do that this year. Uh, so just know that that's a good reason in itself not to ever fall for that because that you know you always tell the parents if that ever if you ever get that call hang up but, or do what frank did play them uh, so i'm here to talk about collaboration uh, and collaboration on fraud because everything's well how, wh why is there a collaboration well i'm going to cover about seven because we couldn't cover everything this is such a huge topic we're going to cover prevention uh make it personal uh you know and something i call mary's my right hand the whitewash fishing um, um, and you've just won Publishers Clearinghouse, which I'm guessing our police chief might even have. This one's been the common one of late. Uh, and then, as Frank said, your grandson is in jail and needs your help and tip, tips and takeaways. But I, I'm going to start with collaboration because everything about fraud can be stopped if you just collaborate, have the right network, and, do, and have the right friends. And there's a couple of us, Eric, who just did, you know, did our meeting. He, him and I have the exact same job, essentially, in the banks. No matter what our title is, our job is to get business loans and business banking. So all of you as clients would have business, you would have a business banker, somebody like me. But I'll tell you, if, if, you're, if I'm the only one you know in the bank, that's a problem because both Eric and I have something in common. We're not our treasury management and cash management people. We are not the specialist in this area. So as a good business owner, you should know who the treasury or cash management people are in the bank. And we are very fortunate collaboratively in this association, I can tell you, it's unlike most. We have a lot of really good banks and bankers in here. And I know she's not here today, but Angie Prop at Highland Bank, she is a cash management person. She knows this topic. She knows these presentations slide and knows how to help people against fraud better than Eric and I combined times 10. Uh, so I'm giving you the real world stuff, but there are people in this association as well that you can collaborate with. I also can point to my friends at the accounting firm because accountants, if you ever want to know about moving money, talk to your accountant first. Talk to people that are in your network and make sure that it sounds legitimate. So that's my two cents before I get into it. Um, so again, uh, the thread that binds is collaboration. Make sure you just have a good network of people that you can bounce something off. If you get that call that your grandson's in jail, you know what, I'm, you're going to have to wait, Mikey. I'm going to call somebody to see if this is legitimate. And just, you know what, nothing legitimate doesn't have time to wait like that. That's just the bottom line. So the importance of making it personal. This is the number one way to stop crime. And I mean that because everybody gets offended when you get asked for, you know, how you get asked for a driver's license at the store, it offends some people. Heck, I'd rather them take a look at it. I don't want to be a victim of fraud. Yeah, I'm going to get the money back from the credit card company, but that's not the point. Because the point is, it's going to make your life heck for a while. So make it personal. So surround yourself with smart people, good network outside of your company, and that's bankers, accounts, attorneys, Chambers, you have a lot of business people that have gone through a lot of things in this room. These are the people that you can count on to help get you through things like that. Number, the second big bullet for me is a phone call is the difference maker. If you ever have to move money for any reason at any point at any time, back verify. And I'm going to use an example of my own. I have a, 
a business partnership, which I had to put some capital in to true up a stock I was in. This is just two weeks ago. I got the call from, his name was Mike, not Mike Kinderman, but another Mike in my life, and said, you know, we need to, you know, we're ready to send the money. Here's his email. Here's his wire instructions. What did I do? Did I just say, sure, and send this off to my personal banker to do it? I gave him a call. And even though I knew that was what he was doing, I made him read through the instructions to me personally to make sure that somebody hadn't intercepted that message before I got it. Because that happens all the time. And I mean all the time. And so I can't even tell you that every almost weekly I get that call. Somebody sent money to something that they truly owed for, but somebody intercepted the instructions instead of going to, to Angie Prophet Highland Bank, it's now going to Mary Smith at Suncoast Bank. Double check, double verify, pick up the phone. And uh, you'll hear this in a little bit. There's something in banking called UBA. Uh, it's a banking term. If you are a heavy cash management user, you not know what it means. And it stands for out of band authorization. That's the same thing. It's the same thing the softwares do. When you, it's also a word multi-factor authentication. There's a lot of other terms for it. But it's where you are approving your ability to go into something digitally through another means. So if you go in on email, it's going to have a text to your cell phone. If it, and sometimes they actually include for personal phone calls. So our bank still has a practice of calling people for wires. It drives some of our clients nuts. Why in this day and age is this as good as you get it? You can be mad at us all you want. We're going to protect your money first. So I'm going to pick up the phone, and I'm going to call. And, and, and I can't tell you, it happens multiple times a month. That's not me asking for that money. Well, that's, that's why we're calling. So remember that. So whenever money is moving, call. Verify. And, and don't use the number they might provide you in the email. If my business partner, Mike, in the email said, hey, if you have any questions, Mark, give me a call at my phone number, blah, 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 blah. I'm not going to call that number. I'm going to call the number I have in my book. And if I don't have a number in my book, I'm going to go onto the thing called the internet. I'm going to Google and say, what is the publicly known number contact for that person or that company? Simple. That's a way to solve it. So again, even if it's in writing, written word is not, you know, it, it might look right. It's not right. So just, you're not offending anybody. I didn't offend my business partner by double backing on him because he would have been a loser too if it didn't come. So another so so a good amount of fraud occurs when within transactions that are legitimate. I know I've said that already. I can't stress that enough. Most fraud does occur within something that is legitimately supposed to happen. And that's and that's what people forget. It's well, it's easy when you get a call from Mikey and Mikey's not your grandson. But it's not if you're no, I truly do owe that company money. So it sounds legitimate. Maybe I just did a, a, a an SBA 504 loan with Twin City Metro certified development, and Mike's my guy. And, and yeah, I owe Mike some money for that. Still, I'm probably going to make sure that I call up and verify that how am I supposed to send it. Or we have a qualified intermediary, i.e. a title company that's doing that work for us in the middle. So again, verify, verify, and verify. So most and now, Mary is my right hand. She handles everything. 36 years in banking, I have had that statement to me 15 times. And it's the company owner, just close your eyes and picture yourself or another company owner Mary's their CFO, bookkeeper, controller. She's the right hand. She has the checkbook. She's been there for 25 years. She's the chair of the church finance council, blah, 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 you name it. Mary's my right hand. I don't need to look at her. In fact, it would be offensive to her. I, get, I have seen more money lost in that concept than anywhere else on fraud on the planet. I have customers, and I'll you know, talk to you about a few of them, that... What happens is, is when that trusted person, they're just all of a sudden starting writing checks to anything. And you trusted them, and you know, sad to say that, that finance, uh, chair of finance council actually happened. We had a company, a telecom company. Mary was her name. She was the right hand. She did everything. So the owner never questioned her. She was out of town for one week, and a, a vendor called and says, I'm looking for an $800 check. So the call came into the bank. I didn't get it, but one of my coworkers did and said, looking for this $800 check, can you find it? And my coworker did not find that check, but funny thing, found a check for $805. No, sorry, Rick. There's no check for $800 to that vendor. The closest thing is a check for $805 paid to Mary. Hung up the phone, didn't think of it. About half hour later, Rick calls back. Did you just say there's an $805 check? So it's just, just chance that that check amount was close to that one that was fraudulent. 
And he said, well, why would Mary be writing her check for 805? That's not through payroll. This is not the payroll account, blah, blah, blah. And so thankfully, my bank was smart, said, you need to do a forensic. Well, no, it's Mary. I trust her with everything. You need to do an audit. They did an audit, immediate audit, and just six months of bank statements found $21,000 stolen. And he just, so he called Mary in, and Mary admitted it, I'll pay you back. Had to part ways, but he didn't want to press charges, didn't want to do anything. And our bank said, that's not good enough. Because we, we, we think that it was too, too light. If, if Mary's been with you for 25 years, you need now your CPA to do a forensic audit on your account. So he had parted ways with Mary. Mary was paying back a little bit on that $21,000. Six months later, the results of the forensic audit came back, $792,000. So my point is this, is that that's the big, those are the big dollar crimes. Those happen. We also have another chamber member. I'm not going to out the company or name, but this is in the last month. Had a bookkeeper take nearly a quarter million dollars. That one was, was out there. Our police chief would know about that one and a few other things. But that, you don't get that money back. That's not, I mean, we sat here and heard the county attorney the other day. Again, collaboration. And there's ways to go around it. I'm going to talk about it in a little bit, the different ways. But also understanding your bills. This one is very common. In fact, it happens with Excel Energy more than any other company. As a company owner, can you tell me how much your company's Excel Energy payment should be? Does anybody know in the room? For your office building, for your whatever. Do you know? Maybe some people do. But most people answer, no, I have no idea. So when they see a line item to Excel Energy for 5000 bucks, they don't think of it. That must be my Excel bill. Well, then all of a sudden, but if you pull a copy of the bill and it says 500 why are we paying 5000 Excel Energy then once every six months will, will issue a rebate check right back. What do you think never hits the company? That check. So it, it just does, it goes unfound. So you, you, think to, you think sometimes that there's, man, there's, there's ways to fraud that you wouldn't think of. It's, a, it's your duty as a manager or an owner of a company to understand how much you owe people. And if you have any employee that's ever offended by that, you should fire them on the spot and move on. They should never be offended. I, as a banker, when people double check my work, I want it triple checked. Because I got access, to, as does Eric, as does Angie Prop. We all have access to quite a bit of money during the day. And that the, 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 I'll tell you right now, the best thing we can do is, is have people double and triple check my work. I don't want anybody ever walking out thinking, boy, that, that could be me. So again, cadence and visibility, review accounts payable and review your deposit accounts. Every bookkeeper, every controller in your shop should know and see you in your accounts every week looking at something. Doesn't mean you look at every single line, but understand what's in and out in your company, go through bank statements, and just the fact they know you're doing it, even if you don't have a question on something, ask a question of one of those people. So you see the Excel bill for 500 bucks, you know it's 500 bucks, but you know what, go to Mary and say, Mary, I see we paid $510 to Excel. Is that how much we paid this month? Even though you know the answer, it tells them you are in the account looking and watching. That right in itself, it's amazing what that will do. So little things you can do as a business owner. Uh, the whitewash, this is the one that also happens frequently. This is not something internal anymore. And the whitewash is, is when, when you're, and we still have a lot of companies insisting on paying by check. I would argue that practice, it's still very risky. Today, you should be paying electronically, and I know some people, my dad is one of them, 86 years old, much more risky. I don't trust the electronic, I don't trust IT. It's still much safer than sending checks. So what happens with the whitewash is if you're in a building, if you're in a crossroads building, some of those, you know, where it just, by every, you got multi tenants you got a big mailbox, all it takes is somebody to watch those mailboxes, and this happens. So. They know that Mary, I shouldn't use the same name anymore, but <laughs> let's just, let's use uh, Claudia. I'll use Claudia for the moment. So Claudia puts this week's payables in the mailbox every Wednesday at one o'clock, and so there's 25 checks. And what they like to do with whitewashing, because there's technology and chemicals today that can take almost any ink off a check and can rewrite it. So they rewrite it to an account that they've already stolen the identity for. So they make some quick deposits, some quick withdrawals, and the reason why the whitewash works good, if if, if Eric Austin writes out a check for $2,700 payable to me, and it goes in the mailbox and Frank Orsello steals that check, he changes it probably to an account he stole. But let's just say for fun, he, stole, he changes it to his own name. In the payee night line, he writes Frank Orsello. So when you're reconciling your checkbook, do you notice any difference? No, because check number 812 you know, dated this, cleared for $2,700, exactly what Eric wrote the check out to. The difference is I didn't get paid. Yep. So what happens to that payroll vendor? It buys you time. So 
when Eric writes me a check and all of a sudden two months later, I'm not going to get on him in two days. I'm going to call him 60 days from now. By now, everybody's long gone. So 60 days from now, I call Eric and say, you never paid me. And Eric says, that's crap. I did pay you. Here's $2,700. Now he pulls a copy of that check from the bank and so it doesn't show my name on it anymore. Bad actors are long gone, long out. You don't notice the difference because it's the same dollar amount. Whitewashed out, you know. And now who's responsible for that, real quick? You know, this is the other part that, that kills people. And I don't mean to down the banking industry, but a lot of people have in their head that, well, the bank's going to cover it because it wasn't me. That's not true. It's a corporate account. It doesn't fall under the same consumer laws. If banks covered every bit of corporate debt, we wouldn't be in business. We'd be gone. That's on you. That's your insurance policy. That's your company. That's your loss. It's not my loss as a banker at all. Mr. Keach. Mark, does that happen if you put it <coughs> in the blue mailbox at the, at the post office as much as it does at your... Uh, no, but there's, you know, I don't want to get into... It has been, we've had people say they've actually put it in the post office. What happens there, it could be somebody stealing receiving mail from a company that's getting it. So if, if, I, if, if, if in this example, Eric's mailing it to me, and, and somebody's watching my mailbox as an incoming item, it can, get, it can get snabbed there too. And you see how sometimes the postman just puts stuff in front of a door in a multi-building suite if there's nobody there. Or sets it on that reception table where there's a, I was in my doctor's office two weeks ago and they had a stack of mail on the counter. I could have taken that whole stack, nobody would have known the difference. It's just people don't think that that's how, it, that's how it happens. So in this case, that's why, just remember, it's not the bank's expense. We've had people call up and say, hey, I know I love you, but I'm, I'm trusting you're going to cover this. Did I, did I cause the theft? Did I create? I mean, there's nothing the bank did there that was wrong. So I'm going to talk about something at the end called positive pay. All the bankers would know it. It's something called ACH filter. And again, you ever want to talk about these things, I'd love to say ask Eric and I. Wait till Angie props back in this room. She knows that stuff like the back of her hand. If you ever want to hear the real finite details, we both have people that can do that, just not us. Um, but, so that's why this is the, what I call fraud for a fifth grader. Um, or fourth grader. I didn't quite finish. Fourth. So phishing. Um, this is the other piece. You hear that term. It doesn't start with an F. I always get challenged. I had somebody research. I had it PF, and I was telling that's not how you spell it, Mark. Um, so, okay. So in the weeds, legitimate and planned cash movement, this is what this is. People watching. And so I got a couple examples. Uh, uh, I'll talk about the CPA firm. I had a CPA firm in Woodbury that was doing a build-out, legitimate build-out with Ryan Companies. $75,000 build out. Somebody was lurking in one side of it, whether it was in their company or Ryan, they don't know. They still don't know to this day. But a legitimate transaction was about to happen a couple months from now. So what does that lurker, that fisher do? They watch for when this project's complete. They didn't do anything right then. They knew that in three months, there was going to be a payment from the accounting firm to pay Ryan companies for the build out of their space, $74,000. So right when they get the email from Ryan says, hey, project's substantially complete, here's the final invoice, flip the switch for the fraudster, he immediately sends an email that looks like it's coming from the buddy at Ryan Company, he said, hey, remember, uh, I just sent you the invoice the other day, $70,000, uh, I think you might have had our payment instructions before, but here they are again. Well, guess what? Those now, that now set of payment instructions had nothing to do with that firm. That accounting firm sends $74,000 to the bad actor. And it took about, because Ryan Companies is a big company, took them about five weeks to make a phone call to the accounting firm saying, I, I hate to be mean, you owe us 74,000 bucks. We paid you five weeks ago. No, you didn't. Yeah, I did here. I sent 74,000 to your account at SunTrust. We don't have a account at SunTrust. Five weeks later. By that time, you're not finding any of that. Because that, where that money was deposited was an account that was already stolen. Quick deposits, quick in, quick out, before that person even knew their account or takeover identity had happened. So that's one example. And then impersonation amongst friends. We got a live example right here. The Eric Austin example. And Eric could tell you the same story, all of us on the chamber board. The minute Eric became president of this chamber, all of a sudden, all of us board members started getting memos that, hey, dude, I'm in trouble. I need a Zelle payment. Uh, I need, and all coming from Eric Austin. Now, all of us, I think all of us, it took me a fraction of a second to realize this isn't Eric, maybe because I'm in the business. So I didn't reply to that message. I took it offline and texted him right away. Said, you know, I'm getting a message for you. No, I'm not sending any money. Joke, joke, you know. And, and Eric's like, oh my God, what's happening? So it's still happening. 
it didn't, it, even this week, was there another one or was it? On Monday. On Monday. So the point is, is that all those people try to do is gather data. That's why it takes a collaboration. When you really want to stop fraud, it's talking to people offline around, you know. So I didn't email Eric back into the, because then the bad actor sees it. No, seriously, dude, I'm in trouble. That's why I took it offline with him and went to some other channel. And now we've enacted, Eric actually embeds a code into legitimate emails for us, just because until that resolves itself. So we know, as, as a board of directors, that Eric is truly the one communicating with us. And then the auto dealer example, we had this one where um, you know, the controller was, or some bad actor, a, a fisher, was, was monitoring the vacation schedule of the CEO of the company. Also monitoring who their biggest clients were. CEO wait, or the, the lurker waits until that CEO is, oh, I don't know, um, probably three days on a fishing vacation in northern Canada. And all of a sudden, the CFO gets a, a, a message, hey, Remember how we're dealing with Mary? I hope to deal with this before my left vacation. We need to send her $400,000. That was the actual number. All of a sudden, Mr. Personally, I get a, because that's my client, this auto dealer, I get an email, hey, from Mary. Mary's authorized on the bank account, okay, number one. She's 100% authorized on the bank account to send the money. She sends me an email to wire $400,000 to this Mary. Again, there's the word Mary. I don't know why I used it again. And so I remember, and I said, well, isn't, I know the owner, I said, isn't so-and-so on vacation? She said, yeah, I just got an email from him. Has he ever done that before? No, but, but I guess he's on vacation. And she got really angry with me because I said I wouldn't send the money. Because I just spotted it right there. I don't think that's legitimate. Because when have you ever sent that client money like that? There's been no transaction over $65,000 with that one vendor. Now you're sending $400,000. I'd rather piss off the vendor. And she got really, really mad at me. She said, I'm going to recommend we switch banks, all these things. Then the owner comes back. Of course, that wasn't me. He fired her, by the way. Only because, you know, he said just the fact that she was willing to do that. If that was, if that was in, maybe I don't want to say any other bank, because I don't think that's true. But if that, if that was a behemoth Bank of America, I can say that because there's nobody in here from there, uh, where, they're just, where there's no name secret, that money would have got sent. Because she was a legitimate signer on the account. Again, it's impersonation amongst friends. It happens all the time. So better be safe than sorry. Hold up a transaction, even if it, it, it meant I could have lost. I mean, we talked about it. We knew I could lose that customer. Because if that was legitimate, I might have lost the customer over it. But I wasn't willing to lose 400,000 bucks for that. So back onto the consumer side, similar to what Frank had. This is the new thing. People get, now are getting called that they just won the publisher's clearinghouse, and they, but they have to deposit $3,000 into a bank account or provide, believe it or not, one of them had target money orders. How, how people would ever think a legitimate company would want target money orders or <laughs> gift cards is beyond me. But winning money never includes writing a check, and winning money never includes going out and buying gift cards. If you remember nothing else, tell your parents this. Tell, tell the people that are in that age bracket that are sensitive, because they think they've won something. There's no legitimate group that's going to ever ask you to put money in first. You also get the same one from the IRS. I've, I've had a couple business owners get this call, that the IRS is, is calling, immediately wanting, saying, do you know you're, in, you know, you're, you're six, I'm just giving you a courtesy call, you're six hours away from a federal tax crime. Your, your accounting firm did not file your taxes the last three years and you don't know it. And somehow they know the name of the accounting firm in both cases. And so the business owner's like, well, I, I can't have that happen. Well, you need to, you, I'm going to meet you downtown Minneapolis on the corner of 4th and Hennepin and you can pay. That doesn't happen. <laughs> the IRS never works that way. Again, trusted network. You call your CPA and, and you make sure you back verified and use none of the contact they ever gave and hang up the phone. If it sounds to be good to be true, it is. So I'm not going to go much here. Uh, we, Frank covered this one well. You know, this is never a call you silo. I don't care if you think you have a, you know, because that screaming grandchild where you're not supposed to recognize who they are. My stepmother fell for it more than, a lot more than Frank did. Because it was, a, at that time, my son would have been 19. And, and he was, you know, just a shouting kid. And, well, Grandma, I need the money. I need the money. Well, is this Drew or is this Daniel? Well. You just gave the two names, so, well, it's, this is, I can't believe you don't recognize me, Grandma. This is Daniel, and blah, 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 blah. 
And it, I can't tell dad. My dad was so disappointed. And then all of a sudden a jailer picks up. Yeah, I'm here with you. No, he, yeah, he, your, your grandson didn't do anything, but he was caught in a car with friends that had a whole bunch of illegal drugs. And we know it's their drugs, but the way we have to do it, we have to charge him. But, you know, I guess I, I know my, my sheriff and everybody's willing to forget this if you just get me $2,000 in Walmart gift card. It doesn't happen. Uh, so whatever, you just ask the jurisdiction. If you ever get a call like that, where are you? There's no way the grandson or grandkid's not going to know where they are. I'm in the Oakdale jail. Well, good. Then I, you know what? Stay there. I'm going to call. I will talk to a detective. You hang up. You call the publicly available number for the Oakdale Police Department. It's very simple. So here's what I'd take. The, my, the big takeaway from this one is my last bullet. As you get parents that age, and I've already talked to my children because Frank thinks he's old. I'm getting there. I'm not too far off. I've already told my kids at some point I want them to take over my finances. That's not, and I want to do that when times are good, not when there's a fraud in front of me. I want them to be verifying that there's nothing bad going on because as I get older, I am less, I pay less attention. That's not, an, that's not a bad thing. So if you can talk to your parents when they are a little younger, say, hey, let's plan for this just to make sure nothing ever happens to your money. It's amazing how much better received this is than after they've sent out 50,000 fraudulently. I had a neighbor, neighbor of Platinum Bank. There was a little house right behind Platinum Bank, for those that are familiar. Uh, you, Stan, you knew the family. Uh, they've now since long moved. He ended up sending out over $160,000 because he bought a timeshare in Mexico and he said he had to pay tax on it, and that's what they kept telling him. We, we started to, and, and remember, law protects that individual. So if I deny the wire, I actually could be criminally held in contempt of that. We took that chance and did because at that time, we're like, you are sending money. This is not right. And the kids finally got involved, but he was so embarrassed. He, did, he struggled letting the kids take over. So do that when, when the parents are in a much better frame of mind, when you're doing it to be collaborative. And then the, as a parent, I can see which one of my kids is better to suited to do this when I do get old and they do have to take care of estate settlements. So that's just a little tip. It works out 800 times better when you do it in that order. So final tips and takeaway. So surround yourself with smart people. You should know your cash management and treasury management person as well as your banker. If you don't, that's sometimes on your banker, but also on, on, on you. Get deep into your financial institution. Get in deep with your accounting office, et cetera, et cetera. Next one, pick up the phone. You heard me say it. That solves a ton. If you just pick up the phone, anytime, and I don't know what threshold it is, Probably not 60 bucks, but if you have to pay somebody one time, pick up the phone and make sure that that's the means. And don't, you know, if you notice on, uh, on Venmo, they have that phone number verification, but you can bypass it. Never bypass that. If worst case, call up the person, make sure you know it. There's a good reason Venmo's added that. Use it. Uh, now, I've talked about ways you avoid corporate fraud, the whitewash. Positive pay, ACH filter, payee matching, that's technology all of our banks have today. So what that does, it, it's, it's a pain in the ass. It's a little pricey. It's usually 100 and some dollars a month. But what that does is at the end of every day, your company sends a file to the bank saying these are the checks that are authorized to be paid. If it's not on that list, it's not paid. And not only if it's not on that list, everything is matched. Dollar amount, low, or dollar amount, payee, date. So if any portion is whitewashed off the check, it'll reject. That's, gr that's great technology. Doesn't solve the bookkeeper, doesn't solve trusted right-hand person, because remember, she's going to have authorization there. But it does solve people taking checks and using them for what they're not intended. The problem is if you forget to send the file to the bank, everything that comes the next day is returned. Everything is, it's, it, so like right now, your checking account is everything is paid unless you don't have money. With positive pay, everything is rejected unless you outline it for us that it's to be paid. A little bit of work, but it's, I'll tell you, it's a great thing. And again, I can only tell you just this much about it. The one in this association is definitely Angie Prop. Um, she will know it all. Uh, and never abdicate your role of oversight. I don't care how big or how small your company is, how trusted your team is, how much double. They need to know you understand your numbers. They need to know you're in the files, you're in the checkbook, and it's done on a very, very, very regular basis. If you do it once every four months, they're going to know they're on to you. Pick a different day, pick a different routine, go in there and, hey, is this 32, even if it's 32 bucks, I, that's what I, that's some of the best advice. I've had people question a small check. And not question, just say, hey, give me the details on this. 
Because that tells everybody in that bookkeeping office of your company or whatever that is, that you are that attuned to it. It's that simple. So uh, you need to be in your cash, no exception. Uh, there's a campaign by the American Bankers Association called hashtag banks never ask that. Go on the ABA website if you want to know. Banks never ask for personal data. Legitimate finance companies never ask for personal data. All that stuff. Two, UBA baby, that's the out of band authorization. Anything has to do with finance, you better have multiple means to go in. If you can just go in via an email, like we were talking with Chambermaster, that scares the crap out of me. You need to have some sort of multi-factor token or some out-of-band authorization for that. Again, trust and verify. And then my personal advice, when your parents are in their 60s or 70s, get a cadence with them on how to help them with their money. That's it. So I actually kept the time. I was pretty good about that. I already have a hand being raised. Quick question, are you now recommending that you only hire male bookkeepers? <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, yeah, I did use female names. Um, but I wanted to, so the bookkeepers, like when you're sending in that daily thing, these are the checks, you still, if your bookkeeper is not legit, they can send that in. Still yeah, because your bookkeeper is the one sending your positive pay files. So you still have to understand what's supposed to be legit. If you're having a bookkeeper, you have to make sure you're keeping an eye on them and there's a checks and balances. 100%. I don't care. People yep. that have gotten lost a lot of money because of yeah. bookkeepers. And yeah, you're right. I have had plenty of mail. In fact, it's, it's the same. The examples on my list, though, in fair, the examples I had were actually all female driven. It just happened to be the case in this case. But um, yeah, you, you, there, because it's one's external theft and one's internal theft. You, you stop external theft really well with positive pay, ACH filter, uh, payee matching. You don't stop internal theft. You still have to have checks and balances internally. Holly. Mark, in the first part of your um, presentation, you said, oh, don't worry, I'll get my money back type thing. And I literally just read, I think yesterday, a Minnesota company made like, I'm guessing like those metal signs that might say cat home or whatever. And legitimately never, people sent their money in, but he legitimately never sent back their money because they would have the people fight to their credit card. He's like, well, they got their money back from their credit card, so. Visa and MasterCard have different rules. Yesterday? Yeah, I, like, I did see that. It was like a ton of money and this guy was like, Oh, well, they just fight their credit card, so they really got their money back. Yeah. And that was Somebody loses that money. Um, yeah. And that credit card company, if they feel everything's done right, they still may deny the claim. The banks itself, I mean, if I screw up and wire out without proper authorization, if I send 50000 out of Eric's account to Stan and I, and I didn't follow the process, I didn't document it was him, that's on the bank. I have insurance for that, and Bill Burns is in the room. He knows how that stuff works. You get, I mean, but if you look, and he'll tell you corporate insurance, that's why I've even had companies, I don't know why I have in there, it has this whole section on check writing and for, I mean, that's why you get coverage as a company to cover you for, for those kind of things. It's, but it's an expensive portion of the policy because it becomes prevailing. In that case, the credit card companies, I don't know the, the exact dates, but Visa MasterCard does have kind of a no questions asked 60 day window where they're willing to usually respond and then they just take it out of merchant accounts. But if they have to start eating it, they're gonna sue somebody. And then um, does that money, and I'll probably make myself feel stupid, but does that money go into our, like, our national debt? Like, no, there's no, that's all private. That's, that's part of, that's, how, that's why you pay 24% on a credit card interest rate. They have to pay for theft out of it. That's why credit cards are very expensive. They, credit card companies lose a lot of money from theft. Oh, okay, because yeah, it used to be like, you would never use a credit card if it was over your but again, that's why this is all about collaboration. Your companies, your also companies, I didn't say this, your company should be in conversation with your insurance agents to make sure you have pro proper coverage. But just know there's going to be a little bit of a payment for that to have it amped up. I would amp it up if I were you. Uh, that's just my own two cents. So give Bill more money is what I'm telling you. <laughs> or give any insurance agent more money. Mark, good presentation. I don't even know how to answer this. Ask this one properly, but I'm going to try to do my best. So in this day and age, we answer our emails on our phone, I go into my bank account on my phone. Um, I have a password for transfer money. I have a, uh, a Uber, and then it, and it's just on this phone. So it's like, okay, I, I've got a relatively, got a password for my bank account, and then I, I'm in an email, uh, all sorts of different things that should be secure and independent, but I'm on this one phone and they're 
they're having given me like an, a security inquiry. Yeah. How do I know that's even legit? Well, stop if you if you don't buy it. Uh, you know, if if it comes through the app, I, I always tell people if you have, let's say you have. Um, a Mayor Prize or Merrill Lynch or or Perth Resource or Premier or High, any of the if you have an app for that company and it's coming through that app you're pretty safe because it's going but if you see it exit that app into something else and are uncomfortable stop if you ever if you ever question stop call the bank just do it the old-fashioned way talk to the people authenticate it never make your passwords one two three four and because if you lose your cell phone for the most part Apple's been really good about protecting data in that phone we haven't had a ton of people come in and say, boy, I lost my phone and my world changed. Where it's a problem is when they, when they reduce the passwords to just nothing. They take off the biometrics, they take off the eyes, the face scan, and they make a password 1111 or something like that. Don't do that. There's too much on that phone. Uh, but usually, yeah, if, if you're filling out a security questionnaire where it's asked, if it ever asks you for a full social security numbers, stop right there. That's never going to be asked. That doesn't mean it doesn't ask you for the last four. Last four digits is a common out-of-band authentication, but it's, it's asking you for you know, one-third of your social security, not, not the whole thing. Anyhow, maybe my root of my question, is that's good feedback, uh, is that, um, again, I, you know, you, you've got so many passwords, and can one organization, once you've used your password, is someone looking can take that password and apply it for your bank? or is someone looking and apply it towards getting into the county? They, they uh, can if you, know, yeah. No, it's, it's, because you do the same thing. I mean, I, I'm guilty of this. There are several websites I have the exact same password for, just so out of redundancy. That's really stupid. And I, I'll, I'll throw myself into the stupid. I mean, you all knew I was stupid anyway, but that just, <laughs> that just verifies it. But the point is, is that the best thing you do is, if, now they're starting to come out with apps to keep like password keeper, password managers those are great because it assigns this unbelievably long encrypted number it just it takes a while to change your brain on how to use those but I would suggest that and keep everything different so if you do have a theft of one you don't risk having every single thing because if you know if I have one password stolen and I've got five cards on it I better change all five now well the big risk comes into your computer too though because I get emails from title company. It looks as legit as possible. Like, you know, hey, we've got this commitment here. Click on this. Make sure everything's right. And, and you automatically tend to click on that. And if, if you do want some of those, they can download a thing into your computer. And yeah. It's going to read every single keystroke you ever did on your computer. Yeah. And it's scary stuff, man. And they make them look so legitimate. I mean, you have to really sit there and think about it before you click it. Yeah. I know I'm getting the axe because it is time, but. If you have any questions, again, this association is loaded with good bankers that understand this topic. I know every one of us would answer questions if you've got it. So thank you. Mark, very good.